Hello, welcome to any combo lords joining me there today. I am here in a slightly different background and had to run this one slightly later than usual for our Monday streams because I am house-sitting for some neighborhood friends right now and did have a pretty busy weekend that I'm still finishing up on the main episode that I was hoping to release around today. So there is an extra fun Combo Class episode coming out on the Combo Class channel. Either later tonight is what I hope. Small chance it'll be tomorrow, because I still need to work on getting the audio sounding decent. But got the rough cut stage done of that, so hopefully we'll have that out a few hours after this stream. And in this little bonus video, which I like to do on Mondays, as well as some other random times throughout the week, I wanted to look at a few graphic representations of things, a few more fun little computery uh, programs, or little interactive visual ways of seeing numbers and shapes and such. And of course, we'll probably get carried away chatting with some comments and other things as well. So. Let me start off by pulling up a nice looking graph and then double checking that I have our chat going. In our Monday streams, another thing I like to warn people about, or not warn, but let people know about, is whichever new shorts and other content I may have put out that I didn't send to everyone's notifications or subscription feeds, little extra bonus things I occasionally put out, such as some of the shorts I'll be putting out this grade. The one I put out this week was one that I more intended for the shorts page because it's a pretty simple divisibility trick that I thought a lot of people, especially maybe younger folks, it would be helpful with. But since all of you may have fun, or not every one of you, but a portion of you do enjoy watching all the shorts, I will be linking them in streams like this as well. And so there are some links to the more recent ones of those on the description of this. And the lowest one of those is a new one about the number 11. Well, also, part of why I didn't worry about bugging the notifications for that one is I kind of wanted to go into the algebra behind why it works, which didn't fit in a minute for the short. And if I sometimes I try and fit a lot into those minutes, but this one I kept on the briefer, more digestible end and figured I'd save the algebraic version for this stream. So we'll look at a little 11 divisibility trait and maybe extend it to 12 as well after we look at a graphic thing or two. The graphic thing or two that I wanted to show are related to ways that we can look at something we've seen before is factors of numbers or even traits like which numbers are prime versus composite can show up in graphic form. And the way we looked at it so far was noting that if I have this equation of y equals 1 over x, I get these classic curves. And it's going to be quite similar if I put something like 2 over x, 3 over x, 4 over x, etc. And that is really telling us if we multiply each side of this by x, the same thing y equals 4 over x as y times x equals 4. It's asking when does the x-coordinate and y-coordinate multiply to whatever I put on this side. Let's say I put a fixed or a slider there so we can edit it but fix the slider to only go to whole numbers. That will be the step value. And let's have it only go to positive integers. So we'll have it range from 1 to 30. So this is now what I'm asking for each of these levels. What is y? When is y times x that? When is the this amount of distance and that amount of distance equal that? And there's a whole continuum of points because I could look at other rational numbers or even irrational number combos that do multiply to something. Like, you know, if I take e times pi or something, well, that's not going to be 7 here, but it would be on one of these graphs if I didn't fix them to just whole numbers. 
But when I do fix them to just whole numbers, and particularly if I ask another question, when are they passing grid points? When is one of these lines touching a spot that is a whole number for both coordinates? Well, that would mean that both of the whole numbers multiplied to whatever is here. And that's always going to happen at least once. Well, in fact, twice if we include the symmetry, because we're always going to have, in the case of, say, when do they multiply to 5, we're going to have 5 times 1 will be on the line, and 1 times 5 will also be on the line. But the neat thing is that the fact that those are the only two times that happens on this line, the one where I set to 5, tells us that this is a prime number. If this wasn't a prime number, 5, there would be other pairs that multiplied to it. So like 6, we have 6 times 1, 1 times 6, and 2 times 3, and 3 times 2. How about like if we go to 9 here for A? Well, now we have 9 times 1, 1 times 9, and 3 times 3. So a composite number could, in a weird sense, be defined as the type of number that on the positive stretch of this curve, when I put that number in, it touches more than twice through grid points. But there's other ways we could look at it. Now, that one's neat, and we'll come back to it for sure at various times, but the way that I want to look at it today real quick is a way that maybe many of you have thought about prime numbers, but I think it should be more commonly thought about is a pretty simple reedy definition of prime numbers using rectangles. And I looked up if they had any tools online on this, the thing called Wolfram demonstrations that I've been downloading some little uh, visual interactive things on. And I looked if they had any that would give me, if I plug in side lengths for a rectangle, will you tell me the area of it? And there are. They're also going to tell me the perimeter, which we're not going to worry about right now. So it doesn't really matter what perimeter says at the moment. We're focused on area. And here's a little demonstration. This one was made by... Sarah, however you pronounce that, leaked bow, blau. And so, shout out to her, or, yeah, shout out to Sarah. And here, if we note one by one, area is one. If we note, what's some random thing? There's like an 11 by 9. The area is 99. Let's make this a little bigger. Now, here, when we have one by something, well, we're going to get all the areas. All the areas are possible when I'm doing this. Same with if that one was set to one. All the areas are possible. But let's pretend one was forbidden. Let's say that we said you got to start at at least two on these. They need to be whole numbers and they need to be two or bigger. And let's say this went on forever. I can go up to any whole number that was two or bigger for the length and width. Well, now not every area is possible. No matter what I do, I can't get an area of five by those rules. And it's not that I can only get even numbers, because I could set one to three here, and then I can get, you know, the three even numbers that are bigger than three. You know, I can get the even numbers bigger than two, the three even numbers bigger than three, and... What, is, what are those, if I continue that pattern? Those are the composites, the non-primes. So it's sometimes useful to have multiple definitions for a term in your head. And the most common definition of prime is, well, actually, they're often described as numbers whose only factors are one in themselves. But that kind of undersells one of the cool parts of it. Uh, those are the only numbers that have two factors. So I prefer the definition that's like prime numbers are numbers with two factors, assuming we're just talking about positive factors, which 
Factor can be a little ambiguous where it often is used to just mean the positive ones. And then sometimes people will be like, but what about the negative divisors, which sometimes are counted? We can assume I'm just talking about that I'll clarify if I am throwing the negative divisors in the mix as well. So here, prime could be defined as two positive factors, which if you clarify, they're going to be one in itself, but there's no other numbers with two factors exactly. And composites are exactly the numbers with more than two factors. And our alternate definition now, because it's useful to have more than one definition up your sleeve, is primes are the numbers that cannot be the area of a rectangle whose sides are whole numbers larger than two. I mean, larger than one. Whole numbers two or greater. So I think that's a good alternate definition. Now, I'm bringing that up because I do mention that again in the main combo class episode that's coming out hopefully tonight, possibly tomorrow morning. And in that main episode, I want this visual to somewhat be in your head, as well as the other thing I want you to think about is for a composite number, if it has more than three factors, another way we could describe that is it has any factors that are bigger than one and smaller than itself. So those are two things I want you folks to have in your head for ways to think about composites. Composites have a factor bigger than one, but smaller than themselves, And that composites can be these areas. Also, if we throw one in the mix, then we could, our definition would now be if we don't restrict them to being more than one per side, then our we would have to define it as composites can be more than two rectangles because that you get two ways to do it for free for each number. So what is the episode about tonight? Well, it's something we did in a stream a while ago in a kind of chaotic way was I was like, let's calculate all the prime numbers up to a point. And I kind of explained some of the tricks I was using, but I decided it was a good time to clarify and solidify those. So in this episode, it will be about tips and tricks to recognize whether a number is prime or not under the overall hook or arc of, in this episode, I want people to walk away with a very easy way to calculate in your head, a very easy way to calculate any prime number under 90 or whether any number under 90 is prime or not, and a pretty easy way to count, like not much harder to know whether any number under 120 is prime. And we could extend it further. I hint at extending it further. I'm going to call the episode something like how to calculate any two digit prime, because that's the range that will be really easy at the end of the episode. But you know, you can add on to it. But part of the point is that there's a lot of little tricks that most of you probably know like half of about figuring out whether numbers are prime. And you might even know more than half of the tricks, but what you might not think about as thoroughly, all of you, is what do these tricks imply and what amount of numbers do they guarantee certain rules about? Because if I was asked before I planned this episode, whether, say, let's say 83, is that prime? I... Before this episode, I would have been like, I think so, but I'm just not positive unless I go through some arithmetic in my head for a while. But now that I've thought through it a little more, it only takes me like two seconds to go like, mm, prime. So stuff like that is going to be, hopefully people will walk away with a little memory of not memorizing the list of two digit primes. Trust me, I'm not the type of teacher who will recommend that. There's probably a waste of brain space Unless, unless you study really particular fields of math, probably not worth actually memorizing that list of, you know, the somewhere around 20-ish numbers that are prime in that range. Um, but uh, it's really easy to calculate. So if you memorize a few tools, I think it'll only take any of you, even if you're kind of slow at math, I think it'll only take you like five seconds to figure out if a number under 100 is prime. 
Of course, what you are going to need to remember is the one digit primes. You're going to need to remember that two, three, five, and seven are one digit primes. That's going to be helpful. But if you forget, even if we even go into a cutscene in the episode that's like, what if you didn't know that for some reason? What's a justification for those being the primes? So that'll be kind of fun. Also, last stream, I asked what people wanted to see for a little bonus fun. Everyone voted bubbles and fire like they wanted propane and bubbles. And I was like, hold on, folks, we'll get that when I can. But I did put a little bubbles and a little fire separately in the episode. Mostly fire because something weird happened with the outside outlet. And so the bubble machine acted weird. But we have a little bit of that too. Now, I'm not going to do too much more about primes here because we can save that for the episode. Just wanted to give a few visualizations of a few ways we can look at it. The main one being, hey, we could define primes in at least two geometric ways which grid points these pass through our factors, and which areas these, these can make our factors. Somebody noted that trying to memorize primes is like trying to memorize digits of pi, fun but not practical. And I not only agree, but I have proof that it's fun but not practical. I'm a living example because in middle school, me and some friends, uh, or for those who are in other countries that don't call it middle school, when I was about 12 or so, me and some friends tried to memorize up to about 100 digits of pi. And I still have the first 10 or 15 stuck in my head maybe forever. It starts 3.14159265358. And I probably could get a few more, but I might mess up after that point. And I'm, it might have gone 5358 at the end. I forget if I messed up that last one, if it went to the three first. But in any case... Start somewhere around that, but I don't remember the rest of it because you only remember stuff you continue to learn. It was something I actually mentioned with a friend today. A friend came over to play chess and he knows a bit about plants and he studies botany and stuff. And I might incorporate some of my friends at, in live streams or various things later because a lot of them have random skills. For example, I was learning about some plants from this buddy of mine and like one thing that he was discussing is how the Latin names, which are like the official terminology that helps know what families things are in, like how math has terminology change a lot and they learn new things about the plants and then they have to like edit the official name and stuff. And apparently they recently edited the name of the pineapple guava species I have where it's no longer called Fehoa Seluiana or something. And they've changed some of the terminology. So I need to look into that. But it reminded me that once I took a class that I thought would be fun because it was called Shrub Identification. And this was in college when I was just studying a bunch of random stuff that wasn't necessarily toward a singular degree because I was still doing most of my time on writing and making music and I ended up getting a job in a music shop around that time. And so I wasn't as dedicated to college as some other projects, but uh, one of the classes that I was like, oh, this sounds interesting was called shrub identification. And I was like, it was actually at a really further campus because I was at a few different connected, there's like multiple campuses I was going to uh, they were in a connected system and this was at the furthest one, but it was like, nice. It was up, there was plants there and stuff, but in the shrub identification class, even though I really liked the plants and being around the plants, there were way too many Latin names for me to be able to justify it. And also, sorry if I was blocking these rectangles much, maybe just in case I was blocking them a bunch. We will make sure that we can see me fiddle with rectangles while I describe this. These were the areas visual. Um, now, the thing about that, the reason I brought that up all here is because it reminds me of the pie thing because the reason I wasn't that hooked on the Latin names was that I already knew I wasn't probably going to get a job in horticulture. I just like botany as an interest, not as a career choice. And I knew that these, all the Latin names of the plants, I was going to forget. The one I remember is the one that is in my yard still. 
And I remember one or two others that were edible. But like the Arbutus unido, the tree strawberry. But I'm probably pronouncing those wrong. I don't know. But I don't remember most of them. And I knew I wasn't going to because you only remember memorized lists of things that you use once in a while. Otherwise, you'll forget it. And so it's kind of not worth memorizing something you don't think you're going to ever use like more than maybe once a year or something. If you don't use something once a year, it'll probably not stick. Like some things will memorizing a certain tool, memorizing, you know, certain things like that will stick, but memorizing like a long string of numbers or something. Nah. So that was why I didn't end up liking the shrub identification class as much as just hanging out with the shrubs. So somebody's wondering uh, if a rectangle has relationship to primes and composites. Does a rectangular prism have any? And you could say yes if we have, and I do kind of show that in the episode. Now, I briefly show with one of the numbers, because I'm using dice to make these rectangles. And to note, I tried to put, I put a little title card noting this too, but I tried to put ones on top of the dice, but if you ever see a different number on top, that doesn't matter. The dice are each one unit. I'm using them like squares or like little cubes or whatever. So they're each one unit. Tried to make ones on top to make it clear, but you know, just treat the dice each as one unit. And so we use those to make rectangles because you know I have a lot of dice around. But someone asked a rectangular prism. I showed that we could make one shape. It was you'll see it's 27. I was like, here's a little three by three by three. That's 27 dice. But there's a reason why I put them in 2D. Uh, it's not because I didn't think it would be fun to make the prisms. It would have looked cooler in the episode to have a lot of prisms. But there is a reason. Now, I'm not going to spoil too much about it, but I'll note that there's something useful we'll find about having a relationship of two variables. And what that does is it creates a certain symmetry. Six times 11 will of course have the same area as 11 times six. It's a little harder to describe the symmetry I'm going for and the simple patterns if I had three numbers there. Now we could use it. We could say that what is the type of number that is a rectangular prism that all of the sides of the prism are more than one. What is the possible? Because otherwise we could just set one of them to one or set multiple of them to one even and get any volume. But we could say the volumes of prisms that each side length is more than one must be numbers with they're composite numbers that are also not s squares of primes or they don't just have two prime factors. They must have at least three prime factors. So if we have something like that. Now, if we say that each side of the rectangular prism is a prime length and what's the volume, that is a name too, sphenic numbers. <laughs> The, there happens to be a name for numbers with three dist... Well, okay, they have to be three different primes for to get the nickname Sphenic number. Three distinct prime numbers. If that's what makes up the number, it's called a Sphenic number. Although if you forget that nickname, just remember, prime signatures are something we've talked about where you just look at the exponents in the prime factorization. And so a Sphenic number is essentially the... Um, I think I'm going to need this Word document in a minute anyway. So that's basically a sphenic number is prime signature 111. Now, and basically the ones that couldn't be the volumes of a prism with side, a rectangular prism with side lengths more than one each. That couldn't be that, which is the number one's prime signature. I guess I'll use these curly ones to be clear. It couldn't be, and let me make this all a little bigger. It couldn't be that, because that's a prime. 
couldn't be that because that has only two prime factors and it couldn't be that that's square of a prime so these are the prime signatures that cannot be the volumes of rectangular prisms where each side is just one now or where any of the sides are just one all right so that'll be an episode coming up before long now, I have this up because I also wanted the Word document to go into that thing about 11s. So, what was the trick I mentioned in the short? It was that to multiply any two-digit number by 11, let's say 67 by 11, all you have to do is take those two digits and sandwich in between them their sum. Except in this case, the sum's a little bigger, so I have 13, 3, and I have to add one to that. So normally if the sum wasn't more than 10, it's even easier. 25 times 11 is just two, the sum of them, the next one. Two, five with seven, sum in between. Now, a lot of people noted to multiply something by 11, what you really do, that's the same as that thing times 10 plus that thing times one. And times one is just it. Now that thing times 10 is that with a zero at the end. So it's basically like shifting the number over with a zero and then adding the number again. Now that is the trick I do in my head to multiply like a th three or four digit number by 11. If I'm like, what's 234 times 11? Well, in my head, I'm like, okay, I got two, three, four with an extra zero. And now I add the two, three, four. And that gives me two and five, seven, four. But I don't think, a lot of people commented that on the short, but I don't think that's quicker than the two digit method here. I know that method too, but I think the sandwich method is quicker to do in your head. So if you have a two digit number by 11, I recommend the sandwich sum method. But let's go into why that one works algebraically. Well, basically if I have a two digit number, AB, those are the digits in the number, not a product. Well those are going to be equivalent to 10 of the A digit, because it's in the tens place, plus one of the B digit. So if I multiply that, 10A plus one B, which is AB, times 11, remember we said 11 is 10 plus one, so that's multiplying by 10 plus one. Well, if we have stuff like this, you know, we can multiply each distinct pair and add all those up. What does that give us? 100A, plus 10b there, plus 1b there, plus 10a. So, here we can add these b's. Well, let's not even add the b's. Let's note that we had 10a and 10b right there. So this tells us hundreds place is A because we have a hundred of A's. Tens, so that just means whatever was the tens place is put it in the hundreds place. Unless the tens place, which is 10 times B plus A, if we put that in parentheses, unless this overflows, then the hundreds place gets a little. But the tens place out of B plus A out there and the ones place gets a B. So if you can have her take a multiplication and like factorize it into hundreds of some amount, tens of some amount, ones of some amount, those are like what you put in the places of the number straight up. So somebody is saying 55 is the only number that's Fibonacci triangular and pyramidal. Uh, that's cool. I knew there was only a limited amount of Fibonacci triangular numbers. I think I might have made a short about that, but I'm not positive. I made one that was about the Fibonacci perfect powers. Might have done one about the Fibonacci triangulars, not sure. But that's a cool note that it's also the only one that's a pyramidal number. So, let's see. That's a trick for 11. What about 12? Well, if I multiply something by 12, it's going to work somewhat similar to that. 
if I want to take like 23 times 12, well, I have 10 of the 20s, which is 102s. I have 10 threes. I have 22s. And I have two threes, basically, even though it's kind of crazy to multiply them all around like that. Because the reason I'm doing that is because we can call that 10 plus 2, and we can call that 20 plus 3. Now, 2 and 3 there give us 6 there. But we'll say it's one six because that tells us it's in the ones place. And we're going to turn that into 10 two times twos. And that lets us put these tens together. And then we can uh, note what we have there. It basically told us that if you have something times 12, your hundreds place kind of copies the digit unless your tens overflows, but your tens, or actually, yeah, let's call this two, one times two times three, which sounds weird, but that's basically what would have happened if we looked at keeping the three and keeping the two digit. And what that basically tells us would be an AB as a generalization, it would be something along the lines of you double the last digit. If that doesn't overflow, you add one of the digits plus twice the other in a way or something along those lines. Yeah, one of one and twice the other. And then if that doesn't overflow, you add one of those on the hundreds place. We could even do a flip version for 21 where you sort of double from the other side. Now, we will dabble in this in a future episode. I don't want to spoil now, but it's not directly about this. The general thing that we'll come back to later is that sometimes you can turn your little algebraic rules, like this little sandwich technique, into why they work with an equation that when you have an equation form, looks really easy to fiddle with and turn into other fun facts. So, now... Somebody is wondering if the two-digit trick work in any base if you're multiplying a two-digit number times the base plus one. And that's kind of similar to what we're going to go back into the sequel that I mentioned, or in the main episode I mentioned, is I won't actually spoil it, but here's a question I want to ask for you guys, because sometimes a question is... Um, a good thing to think about that won't spoil any of the answers, but we'll give you, you know, if you want to think about it, you might come to some of the answers on your own. If an alien wrote this down, would we know that they were in base 10? Because that's true in base 10. Or what other bases might they be in where that would be a logical expression? And let's assume that these are like stand for ones, twos, and threes, but that we don't know how they structure places in a number, like if it's worth powers of 10 or whatever. So don't don't even spoil that in the comments if you have an answer right now, because it will be a fun episode topic later and a kind of just a good thing to think about. But, you know, here's another one. What if an alien wrote down this? 13 times 13 equals 169. Are there any other bases where that's true? Now, to figure this out, you might want to try and turn it into a little algebraic expression like I did with the 11. So, and to give a clue about the question someone asked in particular about, is this just multiplying a two-digit number by the base plus one? Basically, I'm not going to go into the full details now, but like the 11's trick I showed is related to the fact that the number looks like one, one, not the fact that it's a quantity that's one more than how many fingers I'm holding up. So 
Thank you for all the nice comments. I think we are going to move on to another thing in a moment. And one of the other things we're going to include in this stream is I got a few more of those Wolfram demonstrations that are a follow-up to the last episode so we can see something with some visuals, which is in the last episode there I included a classic and this is, you know, going to spoil a little part of it, but it's been a week, so hopefully people have seen that. If not, still watch the episode later. It's This won't spoil all of it. But we looked at a weighing puzzle that helped encode the base balance ternary. And the weighing puzzle goes sort of like... if I Well, the weighing puzzle I put in the episode, actually, I don't even think I found that one. The Wang puzzle I put in the episode, I don't have a visual of right now. So that's actually, this will spoil barely any of it. This is a slightly different one. This is another ternary related that, although this doesn't encode balance ternary, the puzzle I'm about to show relates to the powers of three, and it has a balance ternary vibe going on for sure. Now, in balanced ternary, it's a base where numbers are powers of three for spots, but that we can use one, zero, or a symbol standing for negative one. Now, I was drawing like an upside down-ish looking one for the negative one. Here in this document, since I don't have that, we'll go with T, which is another pretty common one that some sources use to mean the negative one. So... If I saw in a number, for example, in balanced ternary, e, well, how about that? What's this number? One, zero, T. Well, this is a one's place because that's three to the zeroth power, and that's negative one. And then we have none of the three's place and one of the nine's place, the next power of three. So this would represent the number eight because it's nine minus one right there. Funny enough, if I want to represent negative eight, I switch all the ones to T's and all the T's to ones and don't mess with the zeros. And there we go. There's negative eight. Now, in balanced ternary, the first thing before we get into the weighing puzzle is actually looked up on the Wolfram demonstration thing. Do they, what do they have for balanced ternary? And what I found is this, which is, I haven't really looked at much yet, but I think the squares versus the circles are uh, either the pluses or minuses. And... I just thought this was kind of interesting, seeing different combos. One is one, and then two is we have a three, and then minus one. I guess that's on this side of the scale. So what they're showing is this is kind of like the balance scale analogy I made in the episode, this one right here, where if that little block right there weighed two, so this little block here weighs two, and I want to test its weight. like confirm. And by test in the episode, I meant we do need to confirm its weight. I can't say, well, I know it's going to be a whole number. And if I can prove it's more than one and less than three, it must be two. Let's say I need to confirm it's actually two. Well, if I have a weight that weighs one and a weight that weighs three, I can put the one on that side and the three on the other side. And that'll prove that it's accurately 2 in the same way that 3 minus 1 is 2. So this was sort of a fun trick solution to the original question because the question I asked was, what ideal collection of your weights will let you test any number here or any whole number here? And if I wasn't allowed to put them on the same side as the weight itself, it would not be the powers of 3. It would be the powers of 2. If I'm only allowed to stack on the other side, it's like adding... And it's like how binary, I can use none or one of certain things to make these targets. Balanced ternary, if I can use one, essentially negative one by putting it on the wrong side or none of, because I'm not using every single thing I need to, like there I am, but like here I'm not using any of the ones. So I can use none of them, which is like a zero. Then... This is a fun representation and the ideal solution. Our collection would want to be powers of three. So 
That shows the balance ternary we can represent numbers too, with zeros, ones, and the opposite of one. So that's pretty neat, seeing this Wang puzzle in action. But actually, the main one that I pulled up that I wanted to show is something I didn't make in the episode, but I almost put in because it's another weighing puzzle that it relates to the powers of three. This other one I did make a short about a while ago. So the other short I made was a classic weighing puzzle about if you need to weigh nine coins, um, and let's say you know that there's, you're trying to find a counterfeit among them, and you know that only one's counterfeit, and let's say you know that it's lighter. Or it could be that you know it's heavier, but either way, you know like which direction it's off, let's say. How many, and you have a balance scale like that. Using these nine coins, how many weighings do you have to do to test which one it is? And at first, and actually I think I said eight coins because eight kind of tricks the mind more, even though you can do nine in the same amount of weighings as eight, eight kind of tricks the brain into thinking it's the powers of two. So I put eight kind of as a trick because then you really get into thinking, okay, I put half and half, that's four and four. Now I know which side of the fours is the two heavier light one. Then I go half and half, that's two, half and half. So if I split them into fours and then split them into twos and then split them into ones, then it takes three weighings. However, I can do not only eight, but nine in two weighings. Now, the way you do it isn't literally balanced ternary. You could turn it into an analogy. We're not going to describe it in terms of the balanced ternary here, but we are going to think about how it relates to powers of three. And in this case, balanced ternary was kind of like I had an on, an anti-on, or an off. Now that's different than binary in that you in binary so kind of have an off or an on without the anti on. But here it's sort of almost like you expect the answer to be on or off and you forget that you also can do nothing or neutral. And that's why I think threes and three vins and powers of three and the number three itself sometimes are hidden where you think two is because for example, there are on a line, if you're at a point, there are two directions you can go kind of, left or right. But are there three things you can do? Because you can go left, right, or stay. You know, if the temperature could go up, down, or neither. So, uh, you know, there's the past, present, and future. So sometimes when you think there's two directions, you got to remember neutral maybe needs consideration. Now, here's in the puzzle that I looked up for that, they actually have a 27 coin version, not three. Can you guess why the next logical one instead of three would be 27? Well, you know, powers of three are obviously related here. Now, here we have 27 coins and they say that this one, oh, let's give shout outs to whoever did this one too. Um, and I guess to the last one, because I think, okay, we gave maybe a shout out to the rectangles. Yeah. But let's make sure to give a shout out to Ed Pegg Jr. for this balanced ternary notation one and to Minho Bay for this 27 coins balance puzzle. Now, here, we got our coins and they say, one, wait, 26 coins, okay. Wait, what? Oh no, okay, 26 weigh the same and one weighs different. Yeah, so there's 27 total. So 26 coins are the same, one, so it's less in this. One coin weighs less than the others. Now, how are we going to test it? Here's what we're gonna do. You'd think we want to put half on one and half on the other because you want them all involved in a test. But what we're going to do is we're only going to put nine on one 
We're going to put 9 on the other. And we're not going to put any uh, anywhere else. These are going to stay on the side. We just leave 9 coins on the side. And at first you're like, if you were trying to weigh the coins with somebody and you hadn't really thought it through and you're like, we can do it in powers of 2 and your friend was like, just leave these third on the side. We're not going to weigh those yet. You might think like, what? No, weigh all the coins. We need to incorporate them all if we want to go our maximum rate. But we don't because we're not guaranteed one of these weighs heavier or lighter than the other. If they weigh the same, then the counterfeit is out here. The counterfeit must be one of the ones we left on the table. So let's weigh. And it says number of times weighed. And I guess that means that I guess they would have weighed down one of the sides if they weren't equal. I don't know. It says number of times weighed one when I did it there. Now, so I guess now I want to remove all those. And it's one of, I guess that means those were even. So, wait, reset positions. That puts them all there, but we've already weighed. So now I'm assuming that that means that our coin is in the last nine. So now we're going to put three on one and three on the other and leave three to the side. Now we're going to let's weigh. Okay, yeah, this side's heavier. It was in the side that had 19, 20, and 21. We've only weighed twice. So now let's reset the positions. Now we're going to take 19 on one side, 20 on the other, and leave 21 to the side. And let's weigh. And they're even. I think that means 21 is the coin. If we did it correctly, we're guaranteed 21 is the coin. But this is my first time using this interface. And I think it's 21. So let's see. 22. What happened there? So. Maybe I got confused when I was setting them on one side or the other or something. Let me... Try that again. Let's see if this is if it's working how I think it's working. Maybe I just messed something up. If we have nine there, and we put nine there, then we leave nine behind. This time those were heavier, starting from ten. So now we're gonna put a few there, a few there, and leave a few. They were the same, so it should be in the leave a few. Now we're going to put one there, there, and leave one. Same. So I think it should be 18. Eight. Okay, something's weird here. What's going weird there? The fake coin was eight. How could it have been eight? Hmm. Did I do something wrong there? It might, maybe the left way down. Maybe I'm messing this up. Those are the L. Those are the R. Okay, way. So this side is heavier. Oh, I'm doing it backwards. They said it's lighter. Okay, that's okay. Sorry, folks. I got confused because in my analogy, in my short, I said we knew it's heavier. I was imagining what I did like half a year ago and I was like, it's heavier. Okay, start over. This time we need the lighter half. That's why everything was off. I was like, this technique really should work. Okay. There we go. Now we know it's the lighter one. Those are even, so it is on the outside batch. So now here, go three, three, three. Even, so it's on the outside batch. There we go. Oh, reset. And there. What, I guess it's 27? What? Reveal answer? Why didn't it reveal it? What? Okay, something's weird there. I want to make this work. Okay, last, last try. If it doesn't work here, I'll accept that either there's something weird with the machine or I'm accidentally being dumb. Well, the first few times I was definitely accidentally being dumb. So, let's see. Oh, no, no. Okay, start over. Zero times.
Okay. Let's weigh. Lighter. So it's got to be the first nine. Three and three. Equal. It's got to be the next three. Lighter. It's got to be seven. So it's going to be seven. Yes. Okay. There we go. Well done, program. I think that I was just messing something or another up on those last ones about the click to start over and click to reset buttons or something. In any case, I think it's cool riddle. What does that mean for if we had four weighings? Well, in four weighings, we could go up to 81 coins we could test. That's assuming you know one's lighter or heavier. Now, this will return in a future episode because A, I call powers of three purely three even numbers. Although I'm not sure if I would include one in that definition. I think purely three even mean, would imply it not only doesn't have non threes in the prime factorization, but it, all, it does have at least one three. But the powers of three, not counting the zeroth power, are purely three even numbers. We will return to. They have a lot of powers. And what we'll mention at some point in that episode, probably, or some other one, is more weighing puzzle variations. What happens if you don't know if it's lighter or heavier? What happens if there's multiple coins that are off? Stuff like that. So even though the answers are different, they're not as straightforward as powers of three, they involve the powers of three. There are formulas for all those questions that have a power of three somewhere in them. Now, that will be fun, and we will come back to that in the future. So I thought this was kind of reminiscent of the balanced ternary also, where we're not literally adding one, subtracting one, and not using one as directly, but we're sort of going in a way that's happening because if we consider the result of the scale, it's either saying one direction, other direction, or neither of the two we picked, which is like something on the table, which is kind of similar to our balance scale analogy. The zeros were like stuff that was still on the table. So kind of reminiscent here. Another example of a time where powers of two might seem like an answer, but powers of three are. Gotta love those three even numbers. And like I said, purely three even numbers will get some stuff as well. And yes, I do. That is a nickname. That is not official, of course, because three even itself is not in any dictionaries yet, official ones. But I do also think that purely even would be a good nickname for the powers of two. So here in combo class, we're going to start occasionally using nicknames like that. What I mean by it is that purely a certain multiple means that that's the only number bigger than one or only whole number bigger than one that it's a multiple of. Another way of phrasing it is that in the prime factorization, we could say it is, well, let's see, it's better to say in terms of the primes because like a purely three even could be a multiple of, well, it's a multiple of three evens, but it could also be yeah, so every, we could phrase it either way, but it'll be easier to think about as prime factors that if you look at the prime factorization of a purely even number, it only has twos. Purely three even, only threes. So we could also start using feven. I don't think I want to popularize feven too much because for fives, even though I'm okay, I'll understand if people use it because it's, we still have a little work to do to get three even in more articles and conversations and stuff. And I don't think it's necessarily going to help three even's credibility to put Feven. It sounds, you know, at least as silly and it's um, a little less applicable than three even's. It comes up less commonly. But, and somebody's noting it's an integer power of three or two. Yes, everything like that can have nicknames. We could also only call even numbers multiples of two, but very useful to have the nickname like even and prime and stuff. And I think there should be more nicknames like that. So powers, I think, are 
useful enough that some of them deserve nicknames, at least powers of two and three. Powers and multiples of five are a little less applicable. So, for example, in the upcoming episode, coming out tonight or early tomorrow, about identifying primes easy, I do a lot of times in the episode when I was editing it, I, I caught this line like five or ten times where it's something about even, three even, or multiple of five. Because I haven't like you worked even in quite as much as the others. It might have come in once in the episode, but uh, I'm using multiple of five usually when we get to that point. I do think three evens deserve it. I think just like evens do, there is whatever. And the comment here, which I will note is from Corrupt Converter here, uh, says that they like how I refer to them as somebody. Uh, that's partially just because I try and go really quick and not look at the chat too much. And I don't want to figure out how to pronounce people's names correctly and go through it and figure all that details and stuff. But... Yeah, uh, people, maybe sometimes I'll say people's names, but they can be read in the playback. People, you know, can read them if they want to in the stream go back thingy. Now, there could be further ones. Yeah, like so, someone saying Sevivin, and I think we could even just say Seven, Seven with an extra E. However, I would say that... Um, Three evens by far, like, it's sort of my cutoff currently. Feven maybe in the future we'll work on, but currently my cutoff for what I think would be worth, like, pushing for a nickname that it, like, really deserves that nickname. And yes, non threevens are called Throds. And that term does also come up in the episode. Of course, there's two types of Throds, the pre threeven Throds and the post threeven Throds. Now, also about comments, and if anybody ever um, likes their name actually being mentioned or affiliated with Combo Class, well, you can always check with me on if there's anything you want to help out with Combo Class because I do like crediting people, you know, if anyone ever helps me with things in the show. And I also like to shout out people like those linked in this description who are all of my Patreon supporters. Those are super helpful, so those people all have their names here as well. And... Let's see what else we have cooking in today's stream. Because I do, in not too long, want to log back off. Um, I want to do our Monday stream for about an hour or so. But I want to get back to editing shortly so that I can get that episode out in the near future. It'll be out either two or three hours from now, or like I said, could be tomorrow morning if the audio takes me a while because... I don't want it to sound too sloppy and I like we record outside and I don't mind that the audio is like live and not hooked up to me usually on like a really close mic because it gets bird sounds and stuff easier. So I actually like sometimes that I have to like turn up and fiddle with the volume a little bit, but that I have all the bird sounds and stuff. But if there's a lot of background noises or stuff, those come in too or wind can come in, or various things. So, uh, you know, tonight I'll be working on making the audio sound good enough. Now, also, um, with Threven, like I've said, stay tuned, because what I want you folks to do for now is just work it into your vocabulary. The more people saying it, the quicker it'll start getting in some journalistic articles and such. And if you find it in any journalistic articles or get it there somehow, let me know because I need, I'll need those as citations when I try and make a Wikipedia page for multiple of three, AKA three even, which I have enough data for, but I want to consolidate my data in a really clear way when I present it so that the first time I pitch that Wikipedia page, I don't want them to remove it. I want them to keep it. And it'll be more likely if I can cite some article that, when I say also known as three VIN numbers, for them to at least not remove that part, that in there, if there uh, is some citation I can do next to also known as three VIN numbers that shows like 
oh, look, it, it, in this random article, they casually use the word three even to mean multiple of three. Now, I'm going to say that just use it. Don't worry about over explaining it because I think that people can figure it out. You know, maybe you'll make them, th they'll have to think about it for 20 seconds or whatever. If they ask you, what does Threven mean? My favorite response is, oh, Threven numbers are, you know, all the whole numbers that aren't Throd. And even though that sounds like a joke of a response that like, as if you're like just messing with them, it's kind of also giving them a clue to the answer because if they haven't connected Threven even or if they're not confident on that connection, the Throd odd connection will probably make them more confident on that. So I like to do that. Although sometimes, of course, when you reply with they're the numbers that aren't Throd, you will get in response, what the hell are you talking about? What is three even in, I have a second term to know. What is a Throd? <laughs> okay. Uh, in any case, soon everyone will know about three even numbers. You know why they don't get enough credit? Because we count in base 10 and because if we talked about three vins, we would have to admit that the base 10 system is bad at processing them and not ideal. Oh, by the way, so I love base six. One YouTuber, maybe the only YouTuber bigger than me who I've seen who also advocates for base six is a very different YouTuber than me, but that I feel like we have fans in common because people have mentioned them a lot in chat when I have made base six. But this YouTuber called Jan Misely, who makes interesting, weird types of videos about whatever they're interested in that overlaps on some math and stuff, uh, has advocated for base six and people recommended me checking out videos of that. And I did a while ago and did really like their video about base six and like a website they made about base six and stuff. And I definitely related to a lot of it. They were, you know, doing a great job advocating for the merits of it. And recently I was going on one of my old videos, not that old, but like one from half a year ago. And I saw that that person, Jan Misely, left a con. They were like the top comment on it that I somehow missed five months ago because maybe I didn't know their channel back then. But they like have the top comment on one of the videos about how like, oh, it's cool that base six is getting so popular. I was like, whoa, that's weird. So that was pretty cool to notice randomly. It was on my base negative 10 video. But that was pretty cool. Um, I like that channel because even though a lot of the videos are stuff that I'm not necessarily interested in, I haven't seen that many of the videos because they're not like topics that are up my alley. It's constructed in a very creative or like a way that's in tune to what somebody is interested in and not like, oh, I better make a video every week. We better make a 12 minute video with the right sponsorship in the right place and make sure that we look like a Hollywood movie quality. And, you know, that gets boring quick. So I like interesting channels. Now, I will also, of course, you know, make more episodes that are a little more clear about what's good about base six. And one of them will be, it came up in this episode today because uh, the one I'm working on editing is about patterns to identify primes. And there's a moment in the video where I go, yeah, it's, you know, if we, even though this is easy, I'm showing you the easy ways to determine if any two digit number is prime really quickly. It would be far easier if we were in base six. I could have picked a larger range and I don't mean like two digit because that would shrink in base six, but I mean like up to a hundred of a thing, like that actual quantity would be far easier to detect all the primes in base six. We could do even larger ranges easy. And I did like a take where I was explaining how it'd be easier, but then I was like, I can't merit putting in this one or two minute rant about base six right in the middle of this other episode about primes. So instead I just put a little title card that goes on right then. That's like in a later episode, we'll look at divisibility traits in other bases and we'll note that prime hunting would be easier in base six. 
And if we count it in base six, instead of it going up to a hundred of a thing, and I don't mean the number one zero zero, I mean like the quantity, instead of my easy tricks going up to about 120 of a thing, we could go further in base six with our easy tricks. Or we could get to that point much easier also. All right. Now, I like all the suggestions in the chat for all the other further ones of primes you could have. But in any case, uh, there'll be, you know, some different episodes that uh, as we do different topics, base six will come up a bunch because it's actually useful and neat. I'm not going to have to force it in. And same with three even numbers where I've only uh, out of the last, like ever since I started saying three even and assuming that you folks know what I mean or can guess, even though I often clarify the first time I say it in an episode, ever since I started saying that, I've been finding more and more casual times it makes sense to say in an episode the same way you'd say even a lot of times, just casually. And probably only half or less of those times was I like brainstorming the episode and I was like, oh, I love three even numbers. Let's see if there's a good example with those. More than half of the time, it was just like, oh, the pattern actually just happens to relate to multiples of three or that those are like by far the easiest way to explain something or something like that, where I'm just like, oh, I better use three even numbers again. Those will help. So some things like that will be, you know, our combo class staples. Another one I've mentioned that I want you to be on the eye out for are polygonal numbers, like square numbers are technically a form of polygonal number, but also triangular numbers we've talked about a bit, pentagonal numbers someone mentioned earlier in here especially triangular numbers will get a few appearances this season, but those polygonal numbers I foresee coming up in a variety of future topics. Also the cousin of the triangular number, if you turn the pluses to multiplications, the factorial, you know that fella is, sneaks his way into a lot of episodes. The factorial is one of those ones also that you don't need to be making an episode topic about a factorial to have a chance of it sneaking its way into some equation. Kind of like E that, constant E, that thing's going to be sneaking into all sorts of random episodes. So we'll pie, but pie when it sneaks in, we can usually be like, all right, I can figure out where the circular connection is. With E, sometimes you're just like, where did that come from? Okay. <laughs> so that is enough for that puzzle. And this was our balance ternary thingy. And Here we have this older representation. And I think that's most of what I wanted to show in the stream today. Um, what else did I want to mention? Let's see, with divisibility, prime factor, balance turner. That was most of what I wanted to do. I am going to wrap up our stream pretty shortly, but you know, if you leave some more questions, I will be around a moment and you can always distract me or whatever. So time to leave any last questions or thoughts you have. And to anyone who heads out right now, I will note that hopefully in a few hours, I'll have the audio done for that episode. But sometime, you know, in the next tonight or tomorrow morning, there will be an episode on the main Combo Class channel. I also will be filming again tomorrow. And tomorrow, I don't think I'll be filming for main episodes. I think I'll get a couple bonus videos for this channel. There's one that's been on my mind about a little fun fact that I noticed about it. Re it relates to hexagons. So I almost put it in my hexagons hidden inside bananas episode I made recently, but it relates to that. There are 360 degrees. And although that's a very popular convention, it's not like inherently fundamental. There are reasons for it, but it's not like the only choice or like inherently like the only logical standard. And so I figured that eh, I'm not going to get that sidetracked by like some fun fact that's dependent on degrees for that episode. But then I found another core, a few correlated fun facts. So there's going to be something about degrees and hexagons that, and other polygons that 
some fun facts I noticed that will be coming out tomorrow or the next day on this channel. And there will be some more shorts and random stuff as well. And you know that probably more live streams and things like that. I am most excited about the upcoming main channel episodes because I have a lot of fun ideas brainstormed and ready to go. And somebody's noting that Base 60 is their favorite. And Base 60 has been used by some societies, and it does have some really good benefits. Now, I think it's just too many digits. So you could find a way to make it look like Base 12 times Base 5 or something to combine there. But if you just have 60 characters, I think that's too many symbols. It doesn't maximize certain things about numbers because humans don't use like numbers in the millions as often as smaller ones. So to even express, you know, to express the number like 62, we're like, oh, that would only take two digits, but it only does in our base too. And then if you're like, okay, well, to express the number 100, which takes three digits in our base, would only need two digits in base 60. It's like, yeah, but we'd have to remember which of those two digits out of the 60 symbols. So... A lot of people like 12 because it's like a little more than our base and they can imagine adding more than subtracting. But what's wrong with subtracting those later digits? You got the 9 and the 6 that look too similar. You got the 8 that looks like a sideways infinity. You got the 7 that looks like a 1, an L, and a everything. So who cares if those don't get their own symbol? Base 6. Now, of course, that is human suggestion. If you're a computer, I'm not going to say we should start building computers on base six or anything. Computers like binary or like I showed in the last episode, which you should definitely check out uh, while you're waiting for the next episode. If you haven't seen it yet, the last one on the main combo class channel about that balanced ternary is, in my opinion, an underrated possibility to research for if there's any chance it could be useful in computing in the future. But... You know, for now, mostly computers like binary. So, base six is a human thing. And, ah, yes, Stick here noted in the Discord as well, but is noting here that he said he found a cool clock in a thrift store to send me. That is super cool. You know, I actually started the private mailbox that's linked in this description for that purpose that I thought people would come across some old clocks in their house or a thrift store or whatever that they wanted to send me. And I've more so gotten like new things from there, or other various cool stuff, which is very surprising and awesome. But I will remind everybody that even if you, you know, don't want to send me anything fancy, think about if you got any clocks that you haven't used in the past year that are sitting in a closet somewhere. You could, if you send them to me, it's likely you'll see them in the background of a video. All right. Someone noted some quantum computers could use higher bases. Who knows? Yeah. And they could also use something similar to balance ternary, where you have a none and some sort of superposition, where the one and the negative one represent two possibilities for some state or something. Somebody asked how to count on base two on our fingers. Sure, I can show that. Because uh, basically I wanted to do an extreme finger counting episode someday because I figured out like, what are other ways to maximize counting on your fingers where you can do different combos of like, this is down and that's touching and this is that way or whatever. And combos that would let you count way higher than with binary. But I'm still, you know, I have some notes to come back to that, to that someday and turn into an episode. For now, we'll note binary. You can count up to 1,023. Here's how it works. You decide which direction they're going. Down is a zero. Up is a one. And you fold down the spots. Uh, me and my friends, and when we were like 12 or so, when we were that age when we memorized Pi back in the day, in one of our old home movies that we made that I'll dig up and show someday, we um, had some joke about that, about how... Sorry to anyone if this is offensive, but I'm counting in binary that how this was 132 by the way you count in binary. So we would, you know, use our 132 in binary as a subtle way of phrasing that, 
you wanted to give the middle fingers up to somebody. So, you know, 132 in binary, much subtler way to say that. Now, the way that works is because that's basically, you have a one in, these are places in the number. So there's like one's place, two's place, four's place. So we have four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. 128 plus four is 132. I can't believe I still remember that this is 132 in binary because, <laughs> you know, we were 12. The one, the middle fingers up was the one that remembers. What can I say? So how we could count up is, you know, the maximum we could do is there are 10 that are up and that is like a hyper 11 in binary with a one in each digit. If I went like this, this would be like just a one up in that really big spot. And so basically if you're using your fingers each as a digit, well, there's kind of two states we can put them in and they could each represent a power or a spot. And so for the same way that if your spots are powers of two, you need zeros and ones, no more, no less to represent each number. Uh, you could do that here, that way too. <clears throat> now, there are other ways you can count on your fingers, you know, like, for example, I could tap my thumb onto 12 grooves here, and I could have here be like a tens place in base 12, and here be like a ones place in base 12, and that would be like a more elegant way of counting up to 144. So you don't have to be like, oh, I'm trying to contort my fingers. How can I get this one? You know, some are like kind of hard to do with the binary finger thing. So, you know, it's a more elegant way in a way is this lets you count up to 12. This you multiply by 12 based on where you're at in that 12. And that lets you count up to 144. So there are other ways, you know, we could combine those and add to them. And someday I will do an episode called something like extreme finger counting. So thank you to everybody who is joining and, oh yes, yeah, so tens place or twelves place. If I said tens place, you could do that. If you only need to count up to like 130, you could just multiply these by 10 and, you know, if you don't want to do the math of multiplying by 12s, you could just use the first 10 spots, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and pinky just counts as 10. And then I could count up to 100 if I just wanted to do that. But it would be to maximize that if this is all I want and I want to get as many numbers as I can. And I don't want to have many with double representations because those would be taking up spots that I could use for a different number. We would want them to be 12s places. And yes, we could use our toes as well. You know, theoretically, you could have a whole body language. You could be like, if my legs are crossed, you double the number. If I'm standing on my head, it's negative. If, you know, if I have this hand behind my back and this one in front, it's a fraction. This is the numerator and this one's the denominator. So <laughs> there's a lot of options. And in fact, leave a suggestion in the comments or in the Discord if you think there's anything I might have missed while I was planning an extreme finger counting episode. One of the things I realized pretty quickly is that we could go like fronts, backs to a degree, sides. There's like a lot of options of how you could combine this. I could have one where some are touching and some are not touching, like which ones are together and which ones are not, you know. So, all right. Thank you to everybody. I do need to log off, like I mentioned, even though there's a lot of lovely combo lords here. And make sure that you're all ready for that upcoming episode tonight or tomorrow morning about fun ways to identify prime numbers quickly and other fun stuff this week. If you do want to catch me later, you can stop by the Discord that I like to check out or the subreddit, or if you happen to be able to help extra with the Combo Lord world, the Patreon. And I love you all a lot. Super cool how this channel is still growing and doing great. A lot of the bonus videos I put out in the past month 
did, got a bunch of views, the ones that weren't shorts, so it's still going up. And that's actually cooler when a video blows up here that wasn't a short, because the subscribers and people who stick around from that are more likely to continue to watch like my full episodes than just be hanging out on the shorts page. So uh, that's cool. And I have a lot of great ideas ready for both of the channels coming out in the near future. We will also be doing a musical stream, like I promised, sometime in the near future, where as we're getting more into music theory lessons, I am going to do at some point some of those directly that are like episodes about how music theory applies to scales and chords and stuff, and a mathematical look at that. It's very modular and clock-like. And then before that and in and around that, another good example is to pull open a beat making program such as the simplest one on that like automatically comes on Mac computers like I have here is GarageBand. And that one's pretty simple. You know, you might not use it to mix and master a feature film, but simple can be good. I like it and we're gonna use it sometimes to program little beats that, although it's diving a little more toward the music end, for the math fans, my technique is far more mathematical than the average teacher or average musician. And especially if we ever do that little like beat making type of thing, the way I do it looks incredibly mathematical. It's sort of, you know, it looks like formulas sort of when you're constructing a beat. So that'll be fun. And there's other very interesting things coming in the future, but mostly that upcoming episode and that bonus video about degrees will be in the next few days. Now, let's see. That's all for now. Love you all so much. Hope you have a wonderful day or night or wherever you're at. And in our next video, I'll be back in our combo classroom surrounded